the talk is in two parts. I tend to want to humiliate myself by um, uh, doing a demo. Uh, so, is that going to work? There we go. Right. Um, I want to do a demo. Uh, sorry, does anybody know anything about CAD or BIM? Oh, good. Someone does. Okay, uh, I was going to do a bit of a demo on that as well. Um, I'll look. Uh, I don't know where to stand actually. Um, a lot of the, um, we we start off through um, on this one. Oh, there we go. Uh, if you look at so, th there's not that much f um, detail on. We tend to build buildings. We build buildings all the time, and then people get in there, use them, and then we don't really have too much. Um, information on how the buildings are used. Anyway, they did an analysis on a, a building for over 30 years and they found that, you know, a, a very small amount, well, 10% to 15% for the design, one for the construction costs, five for the maintenance costs over five years. So five times the cost of the building is what they actually do just to keep the building running. 200 for um, uh, uh, the, the businesses or what's actually happening inside the building. And mainly a lot of those are to do with salaries. So um, you're using about 2.4% of total cost. Now, a lot of it is done generally in a reactive way rather than a proactive way. A lot of costs are creeping up and people are starting to say, why don't we go into proactive rather than the reactive? You know, um, aircraft industry or it, flying industry, they use it all the time. Pharmaceuticals, a lot of high-tech um, places will do proactive. Um, it's slowly creeping into other areas. Um, so from the point of view of design, when we actually design, we actually have quite sophisticated modelling tools, usually the latest tools um, because we can do it more in, uh, efficiently. I came across a comment or I went to a talk and they actually said from 1964, when computers first came to now, architects have got 250% more efficient. And most of that money has actually gone to the client because we charge by the hour. Construction has become 94% more efficient or less efficient as such because buildings have become more complex. So we tend to use very fast, uh, very sophisticated tools nowadays, but many are not backward compatible. Contractors have specific, fancy viewers and things like that. And a lot of the industry is very... Um, reactive so um, you, 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 you develop a team to do something you build a building then you move on to the next one and it's a different team and they all do so getting new tools into the actual industry is not too hard everybody plays a lot with um, a lot of different tools and if they don't some people are just still in, in CAD drawings and stuff like that the documentation process is all about building a building and that's it contractually we're actually only obliged to actually give the client a set of 2D drawings from the asset facilities managers, their teams actually come from a whole di different background, you know, from property managers, some people who are um, ex-carpenters and things like that, doing project management and office administrators. Usually part of a corporate organisation, so they don't actually have that access to actually pull in and, and uh, use different tools or different viewers and things like that. They tend to be locked down by the IT um, team as such. And they're not that familiar with CAD or BIM. And there's a move um, recently for clients to actually ask for a bit more. So the information is created in construction. Now we have CAD, which is computer-aided drawing. And uh, it's basically vector lines on a sort of an invisible tracing paper. And you can put layers and layers and layers of it with different lines. And you can name the layers and things like that. And in BIM, it's building information model. You actually create a 3D model of something. And uh, we have the opportunity to give much more. <coughs> and there's this idea, which I've come across a couple of times, is basically designers, we, we visualise, uh, we see we have 90% graphical, 10% data. We then have to refine things so that we specify the specific hardware, the specific window, the specific glazing type, the specific air. It all comes down. So we suddenly start punching through with a lot of data. And by the time we get to the FMAM area, we're actually 10% graphical and 90% data. So, uh, asset management and facilities management. With that in mind, getting data out of the mainly graphically based set of documents is not so easy. You know, so if you're given a PDF file with a nice table on it, 
which actually has the schedule or it's um, an equipment performance for a chiller or something like that, you can use something like Tabula or else you've got to actually go through and manually type all of that stuff in yourself, which is quite frustrating. So the information delivered to the client is based on the building asset, not maintaining it. So um, it's, it's, it's more centred about building the building and not actually doing it. So from the point of view of actually if you're going to manage an asset and from the client's perspective, you actually want something that belongs to them rather than to us. We have lots of wonderful tools that we love. It needs to be transportable, so you can share it with lots of people. It needs to be durable, so it shouldn't get out of date. One of the things with Revit, which is a BIM tool, is it's um, not backward compatible. They got really sly on that one every year, and the current li um, licensing is for every year, so every year they bring out a new version, and if you've got a, a, a newer version, you can't open it in an older version, so it forces everybody in the industry to push in. So they're being dead sneaky about it. And it should be used for the next 30 years or so, so this is my argument for using PDFs, they've been around since uh, 1992 apparently. And then there's no special software for using it other than uh, um, for using. So generally, you know, PDFs are ubiquitous. They're on most computers. And they're relatively familiar to use, but they usually only use the T 2D part of it. And it's cross-platform, freely accessible, and works with common tools. Whoops, what's happened there? I turned it off. Um, so, demos. Okay, then first of all, I just really want to shoot through show you uh, a couple of things and now we're going to kill out of that and there, there we go. So this first one, this is a CAD drawing. Um, so in a CAD drawing, oh, come on sweetie, uh, you actually just, you, you're drawing on layers. And basically, if I touch an object, and if I zoom in, you see I have these objects, and this one here, we're going to call it a car or something like that, but it's just basically a lot of lines, and it's on an invisible layer. So if we actually go up, it's cut on all of these different layers. So we can call layers walls and different things like that. So there's data sitting on there that we could actually extract and bring out. But it's not very friendly. So... In the industry, we've been using it well. I, I think the last eight, ten years is really the, the time of BIM has come through. So if we actually go into a BIM tool, um, and I apologise about this, this has only got four mega RAM, and that, I just flick that into... Hmm? Sorry, I'd normally, my main computer blew up and uh, I'd normally have 16 meg. So here you've actually got a BIM model here, and uh, I can... Here's that gone. Here it comes. We can actually just pull that up. And but we draw things. If I touch this object here, it's actually a wall. And if I go into that wall, um, it's got a whole lot of information about this wall. So it's got a hundred millimetre, 190 millimetres thick, and it's got a structure on the inside, and it's got below things. It's got a whole load of wraps and other stuff that you can actually work out thermal um, heat loss and things through it. So it's quite a smart um, tool as such. It also has another thing, and I'll just go back to the previous one on there. Um, it has this thing called a room object that's only visible in 2D. But what it allows you to do and that's the room object that we have there. And you can actually see data about that room object coming down here. And we can actually put information onto that. But it's basically like a big inflated balloon that actually just touches everything around the side. So it identifies anything within that room. So any object within that room will be identified into that space. Um, so it's quite sophisticated in what it does. And we've got two things. We can actually draw actual physical objects like walls, foundations, ceilings, floors, etc, etc. The other things that we can do is we can put parameters onto any of those things. So any particular category. There are specifically defined categories, but we can fire information onto that category. So on that category we can say um, that has a certain, you know, that wall has a finish, it's painted finish, or it's a jib board or something like that. So within the Revit thing itself, we actually have quite a lot of sophistication. 
Now, one of the things with um, facilities management, asset management, is you need to sort of predict forward. So going from a reactive to a proactive area, you need a tool that can predict, but you need data inside there that <coughs> can actually, to, that you can populate to predict. And that's one of the big turnoffs with a lot of organisations, because to actually populate um, a database is quite expensive, especially since 98% of your um, buildings are actually already created. Um, if, like, um, they'll say, the new insulation wheel will actually make new in, uh, buildings in Wellington or whatever in New Zealand, you know, ten times more insulated than anything else. Who gives a damn? That's only 2% of the uh, overall building stock. It's what you can do to your existing building stock that's important. And this is one of the things which has actually stopped people moving into this proactive area because the cost of populating is very, very expensive. Now, the other thing is... is um, so that's the idea of, of that. So within the 3D PDF, um, this is one thing that um, I do, is I actually set up um, plans so that people who can't navigate through can see them. There's also a bar down here that you can change from... Uh, uh, a, a transparent or a, a uncoloured to a coloured. So you can have solid outline. Uh, you can have illustration, all sorts of things. And you can actually have sections through. You can actually um, do perspective through some of these as well. And you can actually touch some of the data if you can finally touch the right thing. And if you touch the right thing, there's a, a tree through here... Um, what am I actually grabbing there? And it gives you some information that we've actually put in through parameters down the side here. Um, but a lot of these things are quite awkward to actually get at. So um, although it's handy to actually have a lot of the information, where's that um, idea of facilities managers have 90% data and 10% graphics? Um, there's a little tool in here inside. Now this, um, I'm actually using Adobe Acrobat Pro, but in fact if you've got Adobe Reader, which is just your standard free 2D, uh, d d d yeah, your standard 2D uh, reader, it'll actually read your 3D PDF files as well. So what I can actually do in here, if I click on the top of the tree there, it selects everything and I can export that whole tree and all of the data, that whatever we've actually imbued into that model, and we can do it and I just call it Lib. So we can push that data out into a CSV file. Now, I ended up suddenly thinking a lot of people want to use the data, so I created a tool that um, has a sort of a front end helping people what to do, but basically it can go and grab that information. Yeah, always the way. Sorry about this. And we can go and get that lib one there. And we can bring that information in there. Now, this is parameter data, so it's data associated with the model. So it's data information rather than graphical information, and it's something that we put in there. And if we actually look down here, you'll see there's about 13,000 lines of data all the way at the bottom which is not particularly useful. So one of the things that I've done is I've just written a few macros that we can actually just take that data and reorganise it so that we just filter out and filter in the amount of information that we want. And this particular exercise I've gone through and I've done it for specific um, different types of information. So this one's for mechanical information, um, and uh, there's one there we can do the lighting so we account all the lights in the thing um, if I fire through to another sheet. To the point the last, the orange arrow just says take that particular sheet and go and push it to another file. So you could quite easily give this 3D PDF and give the Excel macro file to a contractor and say price on painting these walls or painting these floors. And what you then get 
is three quotes based on apples and apples and apples, whereas most times you actually get, I don't know if you've actually got anybody to tender for any work for you, but they always give you different things. So it's always quite difficult to actually analyse. The other thing that you can do with this sort of data from the, the point of view of the information, I just need to go back to the, this particular model here. And if I just go into the uh, ground floor plan, and if I just look in this particular area down here, unfortunately some of these tools are not that friendly to use. And if I was to look at this particular area, which is a cafe area, and uh, it's got this kitchen area, it's got this cafe area here, and it's got the cafe toilet down here. These other ones over the side here are public toilets. Um, if I go into here, I can actually just go, is if you actually wanted to find out the net lettable area, you could actually go equals that plus 17 if we can find it. And uh, I can't remember what the other one was, um, 17. Ah, whatever, we can actually add them up quite quickly. So this is the area where a lot of facilities management people are very comfortable with actually um, doing things. Now the other thing with um, uh, uh, the PDFs is again, there's, we, we, this is in this particular example, I've just got this, which is just the architectural side. I've also got one here, which is um, a fancy thing that has been done when it finally gets there, um, which is basically the services. Now, inside Revit, you can actually split the building and skew it so you can pull things apart to actually show. So this one here shows you where the lighting is and shows you where the services is. You know, I've got one specific... Um, so that somebody can fo follow the HEVAC system. So we've actually got a, uh, uh, an air handler unit which is actually supplying air along the top and it's extracting air, or no, it most probably did supplying um, down the bottom and actually extracting at the top. And it's got a couple of um, smoke extract fans at the very top. And you can extract that information out through the, the PDF process again. And this then is actually done on several layers that I've actually created. So each of these are separate objects. Or, or sorry, just separate filtered views of the same model. This one's just showing lighting. Um, there's one, uh, I think, show uh, power boards or something, and anyway, it goes through and it does sprinklers and it does all the rest of the things. So you can actually split this information apart. So you can actually say, that one there is the one that's leaking. And that's really hard to describe a lot of times, you know, when you're trying to actually send an email to somebody and somebody saying, we've got a, a, a dripping um, tap or something, which one is it? So somebody wastes an awful lot of time going through, getting that data coming through. So the PDFs actually give you quite a lot of information that you can, you can go through. Um, when I was doing this work, one of the um, uh, bosses I was working with... Uh, had gone to Las Vegas and he was going to look for a show. Now, I'll see if this one comes up. And this one here is for the TSB Arena. And uh, so I've got the perspective sitting there um, with a pretty background. I've got a floor plan which will show um, the seating. Now, I actually try thinking about different coloured seatings for different arrangements. Like this one here is um, for... Uh, if it was something like a, a stage show. If they had a stage or a concert, somebody up the end, and then you'd actually have a different arrangement. So the seat values would actually change based on those criteria. And the other thing with this is if you were going to uh, see somebody about um, booking a seat, one of the things you're suddenly thinking, well, what's the view from that seat? And what you can actually do, let's just see if this is going to work now, It's not doing it very well. Here it comes. Is that we can um, link that seat to a 360 degree view. So again, within the um, PDF, you can actually get a hyperlink. And then this is actually created within Revit itself um, but you can actually do this with a 360 panorama camera as well. So we can link information through with the data that we've actually got on here. And again, if I... Ah, I've just done it again, sorry. And this is a problem with the slow computer. 
The other one, sorry, if I come through into here, um, I've actually done this as an export. If I just go through here and export all of these, um, uh, if I select the model and go right click and export to CSV, which I did before, um, I can blow that data away. And, sorry, slow. it comes through and we can actually get all of the seats. So therefore with the seats, we can actually get two values. We can actually say in this orientation or this organization for show, it can actually have this color or this value. And if we have it in another one, we can do that. It's a bit sluggish on this. Another thing within 3D BDS, which you can do, and this one I've just got a video because it takes, um, uh, it's quite slow to use. Um, you'll see that, um, at the end of the slides, uh, there'll be a, a text that you can text a number to and you can actually download the slides. And there's got a link to this PDF that you can download, which is an animation one that you can do. So within PDFs as well, um, you can actually do animations within the 3D PDF. So if you've got something complex that you actually need to show or demonstrate, you can, you can use tools to actually create these. Um, this particular one's quite sophisticated in the amount of um, switches and colours and things that you can actually do on it. Um, nice toy to play with, though. And there's uh, where this links to is a gallery um, by one uh, group of people who actually do this. There's a lot of them out there that do um, 3D PDF animation things. A little bit slow to do, and they are heavy um, to, to actually run. Um, another... Uh, demonstration that I just want to give, and I don't think I've got that one loaded up yet now, is um, this is something that I've been interested in doing, but I've actually had a bit of difficulty doing for quite a while. I'm just going to kill my rivet, and uh, I should have done that before. Which one? Which particular one? That one there. The, the one that you just double clicked on. Right? Oh no, that's a tiny wee one. It's a. It's a. Where if it comes up, yeah, no, that one's. Uh, no, it's 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 a, that particular. Now that's a. Uh, sorry, I'm going to kill a couple of these. Oh, maybe it's coming up. Here we come. This one's a very very simple one, but what this is de demonstrating is um, JavaScript. You can actually add JavaScript to a 3D uh, to, to a PDF file, so you can do them in forms already, where you can actually fill out forms that automates. One of the things with PDFs, though, is that they try and protect themselves, so the JavaScript's got to work, so it can't go in and screw out the the PDF file itself. So it's got a lot of inbuilt protections to allow that. Also within the um, PDF, you can actually work in two areas. You can actually have JavaScript working in the document overall, and you can actually have JavaScript working in the object inside. Uh, this one here is a demonstration of, I'm just turning the roof on and off. I'll turn it on again, I suppose. Um, I can color the roof. Um, I can turn the roof back to gray. I can change the whole uh, model into an illustration type. Has that gone into illustration? There's the illustration. We can go back to solid. We can go into semi-transparent, and a lot of these are through these areas here. Another little toy that you've actually got is that you can show cross-sections through the building. So this is anybody who's actually got this PDF can suddenly go in here and start slicing this through. So you get a lot of good 3D visualization. This is in Z-axis. We can actually switch it to Y-axis, and so we can actually just slice this all the way through whichever way that we want to do. Um, we can turn a tilt onto the thing, and we can turn the tilt onto the other way. We can change it into the x-axis, and we can change it into the z-axis as well. And I find that little bluey thing quite annoying. Um, so this is anybody can do this. So you can actually navigate yourself around through a model. 
um, if you need to do that. So to create this, um, you, you need a, a little add-in to Revit that will actually create the PDF file, but once it's actually created, you can do it. Um, I'm just starting to use the JavaScript, and one of the things with this is what, with this JavaScript here just takes the roof and rotates the roof through the x-axis, um, which is sort of cute. And this one actually extends the roof. And if you suddenly find you've got yourself into trouble, the nice thing you do is just go back to one of your previous views. The other thing with this JavaScript is it's acting within the actual file itself, but it's not actually saving anything to the file. So as soon as you close the file down, you reopen it up again, it just comes back to what it was originally. So you're not actually transforming any of the data in there. You've got tools to actually uh, manipulate the data, but you're not actually um, uh, uh, doing um, anything for, that is actually destructive to the PDF, which has its good points and its bad points. And one of the things, if you're looking for a tool that you're going to use over time, things will change. So therefore, you need some way to actually change things. So th there's three ways that you can do that. Um, there's a 2D comment box that you can actually have. So you can actually add a 2D comment um, into the PDF. And uh, it takes, it reads your identity, although I think within the file properties you can actually give it an ID somewhere where it can actually say who specified the note that came through. And again, sorry, I think I've got too many things open for this. Um, just to see if I can close that again. No, die, your mother. Now, why is that showing up? That shouldn't show up. So anyway, you can do a 2D note, you can also do a 3D note, and you can also do a stamp. Does anybody use stamps inside um, uh, uh, PDFs? You can do a sort of draft stamp or something like that, but you can also put some JavaScript in there, so you can actually have empty cells, and you can say, oh, make a specific thing happen. So, um, oh sorry, that's now died. Uh, so, I'll just go and... A couple of difficult things with PDFs. One is if you're pulling a PDF down in a browser, if you've got a 3D um, object within your file, it will just show it as blank. So what I now I do is I actually append a 2D page at the front explaining that it's a 3D file, that you actually have to download it and open it um, in, inside your, uh, from your actual file directory itself. Um, you can actually do it, but you've got to go and set your settings up within your browser, and what you actually tell your browser is if a PDF comes through, go and open it in, in Adobe Reader. So um, one of the... Uh, no, I haven't got those. I'm just going to tools. One of the things with actually going in and uh, trying to get an object in there is that you must identify that particular object. This was what actually gave me difficulty for a very long time. Um, if I just go into interactive object and select something, uh, I will select roof off. And here's a very embarrassing, sorry about this. We'll leave that for the time being. So um, just coming back, the pros, uh, it's versatile, it's shareable, it's free to access, JavaScripts you can use to enhance the actual information in there. Um, with extract, oh, now it's come up. So in the other ones here is that's an actual button and it actually says read a JavaScript. And inside the JavaScript itself, the first line that you've got to do is you've got to get the annotation. So you've got to find the actual first page. You've got to find the first object that happens to be this 3D object floating in there and then you've got to use this context ID. That gets you into that object, and then from there you can actually use things like scenes, nodes, meshes, and other things 
to actually start telling it what you want to do within that fact it, within that item itself. So I've only just found out about them, so I'm actually just starting to play with them at this point in time. Uh, but it is a useful tool because it just means um, you can be a bit more versatile. Um, going back to the presentation again, sorry. So with the extraction tools, you can actually get the data out quite easily. You can share that data. You can send the information across to contractors. You can get, use it for other things. Uh, a common format as well, and one of the things is it, it, it is backward compatible to a certain extent, and it is forward compatible. There most probably will be better browsers that will actually view things. I was actually just seeing one where they were letting you view Revit files through a browser, and I think it was $1,000 a month. Um, uh, and I'm not too sure if that was for the team or per person, but it was a wicked price. Um, the cons on this, the files can be large. You're actually punching an awful lot of data in there, and there is a very rich environment. There are ways to actually break the file down into smaller areas so that you've almost got, if you have a very large file, break it into four separate areas or something like that to reduce those. Um, no browser viewer for the 3Ds. And the JavaScript can be a bit awkward just because of the fact that, you know, it's, it's um, not allowed to hurt the actual file itself. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, Max, why PDF? I mean, uh, first question, is it, is it portable in the sort of time frame that you have in mind? Because we heard, I mean, PDF slash A is designed for portability, but certainly does not allow for interactive learning of the, um, the browser. And second question, isn't uh, plain HTML with embedded JavaScript I haven't been able to get this much data into an HTML format, okay. you know, as far as the graphics and the things uh, go. There are PDF, <coughs> you know, like within the aircraft industry, they use the PDFs and the 3D PDFs all the time to actually transfer all the way through um, because of the fact that you can sit the data in the back. With HTML, you know, uh, you know, like we're slicing that data, we're slicing that model all the way around. Within... Um, in the old CAD days, everybody would have a different program, and there was a DXF format that was supposed to share. It was never that robust. Within the BIM, there's one called IFC, which is, oh, I can't remember what it's called now, which is a similar one all the way through, and there's a lot of viewers that work on the IFC, but you have to download specific tools to do it. And one of the things with that is that a company may have those tools, but their contractors may not. So this is the thing where... What I've actually found, like, well, we were doing this uh, for Welland City Council, and a lot of the people, you, you know, just can't even use any of these tools. A lot, they're mainly administration people or something, so they, they, they've got no access. And if you do buy the, the better tools, they're usually got quite an expensive license, so um, there's a big cost. No, 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 it's just, it's just running in there as to whatever it is, yeah. But again, again, it's actually having to generate it within that file itself, so the files too get big. So again, if you... Um, this one here's got a whole load of PDFs, so you can download those. Those are the ones that I've actually created. I think there's something like the Michael Fowler Centre through there that, you know, you, 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 can, you can go and do. And I think I've got a chopped-down version of the macro that actually I, I built to actually start extracting. And that is a specific... Tool, that is a specific program that pulls the data out in a different way. If you get another PDF extractor, it will structure the data in its own different way. So um, it's one of those things. Again, this SimLab um, is the one where you can get that information there. And there is an extraction thing, um, benchmark operand. So I have just been of interest. Sorry. Now, th 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 this is the thing. There's, there's one called Bluebeam. There's a few other. There's a cute CAD, and there's all sorts of CAD ones out there. A lot. A, a lot of them will do part of what the Adobe Reader will do. Like a lot of them won't actually have the um, model tree on the side, or they won't have the data bit. The Bluebeam sort of has it, but it's hidden away somewhere else. And then when I've been playing with that, I haven't been able to extract it. So. Um, I've just found that the simple... Um, one of the things with the 3D area, Adobe did the 2D stuff. They started to develop the 3D, and then they said, ah, oh, too hard, and they just let it out. So 
they, other people are doing the 3D stuff, not Adobe themselves. Yeah, it should. Well, have you got PDF? I don't know. Well, uh, what's... Actually, I'm not really Linux-based, so... Um, I, I played with about 10 different PDF view, uh, viewers as such, and some work and some don't, so um, I think you just have to play and find out which ones actually do the things that you want. Mine was focused on getting that model tree and getting that data out into an accessible way, um, because... Personally, I've gone to a lot of facilities managers' place. I've got the mechanical drawings. I've got tables of all the mechanical equipment, and I've actually had to manually type it all back in again. So things like this I find a lot nicer. Anything else? How long have 3D PDFs been around? That's, that's yeah, well, again, 90, I don't know how long the 3D PDFs have been around. I think from the, uh, I think from the early noughties, in a way. Yeah. But apparently in 1992, when they first came out, to buy Adobe Reader, you had to pay 50 bucks US, and that just didn't fly, so they gave it away for free, and it seems to work a lot better. But, but also, that's made the PDF specification open, so that you can download Yeah, yeah, PDF. yeah. Uh, can write their own yeah, and, <coughs> and uh, it, it, it is, yeah, they've got the JavaScript ABI for the 3D thing. I find it bloody unfriendly because I'm not a coder um, directly. I'll try and do things and manipulate them. Um, some bits seem to work and other ones don't. But yeah, um, the, the Sophie, uh, these people, SimLab, they're actually in Jordan and I think they took off, they've taken over the original Adobe one. Um, it was Tetra 4 but there's, there's quite a few out there who are still using this format. And I think just because it's backward forward capability. And the Bluebeam one is very, very sophisticated, but it's more to do with the construction phasing of things for redlining and clouding and all of that sort of stuff. And again, a lot of them now are looking at embedding uh, 360 panoramas within the actual PDFs themselves. But it just makes them really heavy file as well. Um, again, this one here actually is a PDF, uh, it's got a Revit plugin for that. So I think a lot of them will actually have their own plugins for certain things. So you, uh, the CAD format used to have a plugin that would actually then create the PDF from those ones there. Um, one of the things with um, making the stamps and the um, uh, the stamps and the comments, a lot of them are still live, so you can save them, but when you go back in again, you can then move them around a bit. And uh, so they actually have this flatten command, and the best way to actually flatten them is actually just to print the PDF, and it just flattens the whole thing. The thing is that suddenly your 3D PDF, your 3D bit just gets flattened into a 2D object. But it's a way of, if you actually want a record, of going through because one of the things which happens is that buildings change over time but you don't actually alter anything you sort of wait until there's a cumulative amount of changes and then you'll go back and re-document it so this is a way that you can actually gather those inf bits of information along the way